part three of theory. So this is the last part of these notes. Um, and we're still talking about how marine organisms survive in such a salty environment. How do they get their oxygen, get rid of their carbon dioxide, um, and in this case, we're talking about you know like simple diffusion over tissues, and um, but in a moment we'll talk about how fish get water over their gills. Okay, so invertebrates like uh, coral polyps and anemones, which are very similarly related, you can imagine an anemone just being bigger. You know. Um, they have tentacles, they have nematocysts, they have a gastrovascular uh, cavity, a GVC. Um, Cenosarc, well, they're not Cenosarc because that's the tissue that connects one polyp to another, right? And um, regardless, simple diffusion is what we're talking about. And that's how these organisms absorb their, gas ex their gases from the outside environment. Um, essentially, that's how they breathe. They don't have gills. They don't have lungs, right? I mean, how do they get their oxygen? So um, they have very thin tissue layers that allow for active and tr passive transport right from the outside environment, which is pretty amazing. Imagine you didn't have to breathe and you can just absorb oxygen through your skin. That's pretty cool. So there are a lot of terms here that we do not need to know, um, like subcalicodermal sites and things like that. We, thank goodness we don't have to know that stuff. Um, you are still responsible for this essential picture of um, an anatomy of a coral polyp or a sea anemone type of creature. Tip, uh, I would stay with coral polyp as far as I understand. Um, so. Just know that it's simple diffusion through the exterior tissues, okay? And interior as well. Water that comes in, they could also absorb that way. That's how um, exposed anemones, we saw pictures when we were learning about a rocky shore, when they pull their tentacles in and there's no water around them, where are they getting their oxygen from? They have drawn water into their gastrovascular cavity and they are using the oxygen that's in that water until the tide comes back up again. Okay, so now we've same exact um, topic, okay, same topic, but different animal. Now we're moving on from polyps to grouper, and then we're gonna go to tuna next. So grouper, are, and this is of course, this is not grouper, this is just showing you um, fish that are similar. I didn't even look for a grouper picture, sorry, but it's not important. Um, <clears throat> motility and habitat. So a grouper is, breathes with something called pumped ventilation. A grouper is demersal, meaning it typically sits on the bottom, benthic. It doesn't swim a lot. So it has to, so essentially it's sitting there waiting for prey, and then, it, you know, they're very fast. I don't know if you've ever seen a grouper bite something, but they're lightning fast. Something comes by and they're hungry, they're gonna boom and catch it. They're big mouth. Um, so they're not swimming, how is the water getting over their gills? How is the water getting over these filaments? They have a simple system. It's called pump ventilation. They open their mouth, which closes, when we open their mouth, their opercula close. So open mouth, opercula close, okay? And that creates a low pressure vacuum in the buccal cavity, which is the mouth. And that draws water in like a straw, just sucks water in. Then when they close their mouth, close mouth, opercula open. So close mouth, opercula open. And that creates a negative pressure further back, which pushes the water over the gills and back out. And then that's and you've seen fish go. That's what they're doing. They're pump ventilating water 
over their gills. So into the, into the mouth and out the pharynx. And that's how they breathe. On the other hand, you have ram ventilators. Ram as in, you know, like going that way, okay? So these fish are essentially constant movers because if they don't, they'll drown. Imagine if we had to constantly move to force air into our lungs. What a different world we would live in, right? Okay, we'd never be able to sit still. So that's, what, that's, the, that's the lives of these fish, like sharks and tuna. They have to constantly swim to push water over their gills in their mouth and over their gills and out. These fish don't have, um, sharks particularly don't have an opercula, so you can see how that's related to um, the um, pump ventilation, okay? Pelagic fishes, now a lot of them do have opercula, don't get me wrong, I'm just talking about sharks in that respect, because um, they're cartilaginous. I believe, I believe virtually all bony fish have an opercula. They have a higher oxygen demand because <clears throat> they're constantly swimming. All right, next one, moving on. It's only uh, 43 slides, so we only have six slides left on this part. It's a quick, quick session of notes, but it's kind of complicated. So um, explain why marine organisms may need to regulate their water content and ion content with reference to the composition of seawater and body fluids. That is a rather lengthy um, subject, but or standard. But it's actually rather, rather simple because we've already talked about hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic solutions and what those solutions will do to cells if they're put into that uh, environment. A certain fish can travel from salt to fresh and fresh to salt, and others can't. And it all has to do with their ability to regulate, to regulate. So again, they live in an environment with high salinity and low water potential. Remember, water potential for pure water is zero. And the moment you add solutes, that number goes down. So low water potential. Salt water has a lot of dissolved solutes in it. All different kinds of salt uh, ions. So in seawater, so sea that's approximately 450 um, millimoles per cubic decimeter. Remember what a decimeter is. Deci is a tenth of a meter. Not a decameter. A decameter would be 10 meter sticks. So here's one meter stick, okay? Deci is a tenth. So like between 30 and 40 here, okay? <clears throat> That's a so a, a cubic decimeter would be a cube whose sides were all this length. That's what we're talking about here. <clears throat> and if you are taking chemistry, you know what a mole is. If you haven't taken chemistry, you'll learn what a mole is. Okay, it's a measure of atoms. Okay, and this is essentially an atom that has a charge. It's called an ion. Um, and so potassium, you can see, is a lot less. But look at the muscle body fluid. It's, lo it's higher. Higher. Jellyfish, about the same. Um, eel. Now, eels can go to fresh water. They're actually, they, they spawn in fresh water, and they're born in fresh water, and they go back out to salt water again. So that's why you're going to have a, a markedly different number for these two, salmon and eels. They both do the same thing. So depending upon which organism you're talking about and what environment they live in, they're going to be either an osmoconformer, 
or an Osmo regulator. They're either going to conform to the surroundings um, or they're going to regulate their, um, their water potential, essentially, their salinity content, their, you know, that kind of thing. So it's similar to uh, cold water, a cold-blooded and a warm-blooded um, organism, but in this case, their ability to deal with dissolved solutes, okay? So uh, here we're gonna talk about mussels first, and then we're going to talk about tuna later. Now remember the bell work question at the beginning of the notes that had a picture of mussels, had a fish's gills, um, some other organisms, <laughs> at, at, I think four, and at the very top of your notes, there were four places, and you were supposed to discuss their ability to adapt to certain changes in their habitat, in their ecosystem that they live in. So this might help you answer the one about the muscles. So an osmoconformer has with the same internal solute as the surrounding water, okay? They conform to their environment, osmoconformer. The isot they have isotonic body fluids and external water. They are this, virtually the same. Like muscles, we saw the, the numbers on the last slide, virtually the same, muscles, okay? And they, they live in estuaries, with fluctuating water uh, potential. Because, you know, when it rains, uh, the rivers swell and they dump a lot more runoff, a lot more water, fresh water, mixing into the salt, which it's constantly changing. They close their shells to prevent seawater contacting the body tissue. And when the tide goes out, they close their shells to prevent it from um, diluting in that way. So they can increase and decrease their solute concentration in their, of their cells if the external salinity changes. They conform to the environment. Osmoconformer. Can't say it any easier than that. Then we have the tuna, which are osmoregulators. Tuna. That is not a tuna. That is a tuna. And that's a shark. We know that. Okay. Bull shark. <clears throat> it's a salmon. So osmoregulator, they maintain an internal concentration. They don't conform to the external environment. Just like um, warm-blooded creatures don't conform to the environment. Otherwise, um, you know, yesterday the weather was cool, so it'd be like you, you know, go, your body temperature going down to the temperature of the weather outside. That's, that's not what we do. And that, that's not what they do. They maintain a stable-ish um, solute concentration in their, in their tissues, body fluids. Salmon migrate from freshwater to the ocean and maintain their internal solute concentration. Tuna live offshore their entire lives. The salinity doesn't change. They don't need to um, conform. And then bull, bull sharks migrate from the ocean into freshwater rivers. They're one of the few species of sharks that have been known to go rather high up into rivers. Or deep into rivers? No. Long into rivers? I don't know. Way up there. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So now we've got two new terms that are probably also new to you. So... Um, although you have done your index cards, so these should be at least mildly familiar. The osmoregulator, the osmoconformer, the urihaline, and the stenohaline. And there's ways to remember this. Okay, so urihaline, they can tolerate wide range of salinities. So this is an organism that, um, like the ones we talked about, with bull sharks, the salmon, the mussels, they can go into freshwater rivers or live in estuaries because the salinity is always changing in those, in those areas. Urihaline. Uri is like Europe 
and think of how wide Europe is. You could, you know, wide Europe. I don't know. You come up with something better, okay? The other one's easier, okay? Stenohaline, urihaline, stenohaline. These are organisms that can tolerate narrow range of salinities. So, can a stenohaline organism go into a river? No. That's how you remember that. Or you can, again, come up with your way of remembering it, okay? So, very simple, uh, just new vocabulary. One more slide after this. So, the processes of osmoregulation in, in uh, salmon, for example, or in tuna, okay? So, main, remember, osmoregulate means to maintain that solute concentration. So, this is how they do it. This is the physiology of that system for both a um, saltwater fish and a freshwater fish. We're going to compare and contrast those two scenarios. <clears throat> so in marine fishes and saltwater fishes, we know the surrounding water typically has a higher salinity. It's hypertonic, vocab word, in that their cells, than their cells and body fluids. Speaking of vocab words, remember in FRQ questions, FRQs on tests, you have to always, when you're explaining, describing, um, you have to use vocabulary words in your descriptions. So the more that you practice with these words, um, the better your answer will be and the more points you will score, okay? So because of this, they have to constantly drink seawater to replace the water lost by osmosis through their gills and, and other body tissues. Drink seawater. And of course, there's obviously going to be salt in there. And when they eat, they also absorb salt that way. So now, even though their gills are made to constantly actively secrete sodium and chlorine, um, and they do that with these spe special uh, pumps, ion pumps that need lots of energy. So they use ATP to do this. Other ones, so the sodium and the chlorine are excreted through the gills. Okay, active excretion through the gills. The, there are other ions in salt water, magnesium and sulfate, for example. The gills don't take care of those. The kidney takes care of those, and so small amount of concentrated urine. So when, when a sea, when a saltwater fish pees, their urine is very concentrated and of low volume. But concentrated meaning a large amount of salts, so magnesium and sulfate, for example, among others. So drink a lot of water, Chlorine is the gist of this whole thing, okay? They drink a lot of water to combat um, water loss by osmosis. Chlorine and sodium are excreted through the gills and other ions are excreted through highly concentrated amounts, uh, you know, not amounts of, small amount of urine, highly concentrated uh, with salts, okay? That's saltwater fish. So you can imagine a freshwater fish will kind of be the opposite of all this stuff. So let's take a look at it. So for freshwater fish, fishes, different species of fish, um, like salmon, the surrounding water has a lower salinity than their body tissues, body fluids. It's hypotonic. So they don't need to drink a lot of water. They drink small amounts of water. And those gills actively pump sodium and chloride, chloride into the body and the fluid to help them regulate. 
Um, that also requires the use of ATP. And because they're kind of the opposite situation, they, are, they produce large amounts of urine that's dilute with salts because they need to take in the salts, whereas the saltwater fish needs to get rid of salts, you see. So that's the difference between the two. Now we're going to watch a very short video, it's about two minutes, on this subject. Um, and there's some questions, two questions on the board that uh, you have to answer at the bottom of your notes, okay? based upon that. So here it is.